Hi, and uh, welcome everyone uh, to our final Cavalry conversation on science communication of the semester. Uh, we will start up again in the fall, but we're very excited about this one. My name is Dan Fagan. I'm a professor of science journalism here at NYU's Arthur Carter Journalism Institute. And I uh, run the Science Health and Environmental Reporting Program and the Science Communication Workshops here at NYU. We are all about figuring out how to communicate science effectively to large audiences. And this speaker program, with the support of the Cavalry Foundation, is all about figuring out how best to do that uh, on a whole range of important scientific topics, including this one, which is of extreme personal interest to me since it's part of my current uh, book project. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to have two people who I've admired for a, a long time, Joe Roman and Emma Maris, here with us. Uh, and I will leave it to Lee, as always, to do the formal introductions. Uh, turning, turn, so I'll turn it over to Robert Lee Holtz. Uh, distinguished writer in residence here at the Carter Institute and the science writer for the Wall Street Journal. Lee, you have the floor. Thank you, Professor Fagan. So, uh, on this rainy evening in New York, welcome to the Cavalry Conversations on Science Communication. Uh, our purpose, as, as uh, some of you here already know, is to dig into how we tell the story of science. And to do that, we straddle both sides of the fence uh, between uh, scientists who reach out to the general public and journalists uh, who cover those fields. And together we're going to poke around in their effort uh, to convey complex new research to the general public. Uh, and we locate ourselves at this confluence of science and journalism because it's our hope that uh, researchers and reporters together can uh, find some common ground uh, air common concerns, find fault, share insights, and uh, together maybe find some ways to better bring the public into new research. So I have to say that we are here tonight uh, to talk about changing ideas of nature and the future of conservation, and it's an uncomfortable moment to be doing this. Uh, this month, uh, the uh, federal government, the Trump administration's proposing uh, an end to the 40-year rule that protects threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, a fierce opponent of the Endangered Species Act has been picked to oversee um, the uh, agencies that are responsible for administering it uh, in the uh, Interior Department. And um, the Environmental Protection Agency, as some of you may have noticed uh, just the other day, announced a new regulation that would effectively restrict the kinds of scientific studies uh, that can be offered in as evidence uh, when the agency is making uh, regulatory decisions and, and policies. And so at this kind of moment, this kind of political moment, uh, any step to reconsider our approach to conservation and to species protection can feel like an invitation mm -hmm. to abandon some very hard-won uh, protections. Yet it's also uh, uh, clearly quite important um, at the same time to understand that it is quite probably long past the moment to broaden our definition of nature and embrace uh, new ways to foster it. So that's the jumping off point for our conversation here this evening. Now, I want to say that these conversations are sponsored by the Cavalry Foundation and by the NYU Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program under the leadership of Dan Fagan. Um, as we go, please, 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 join in, ask your questions, give us opportunities to digress, um, but please do so using the microphone, and those of you online can uh, ask your questions on Twitter uh, via the hashtag Cavalry Convo. So, we have here tonight with us two, may I say, contrarians of the conservation movement, uh, each in their own way. Emma Maris, uh, who joins us from Oregon, and Joe Roman, who flew here this morning through the rain from Vermont. Um, Emma Maris is an environmental writer of some renown. She's the author of The Rambunctious Garden, which is a quite marvelous book, um, Saving Nature in a Post-Wild 
world. Uh, she's a master's in science writing from the Johns Hopkins. She's uh, written for publications such as Nature, Discover, and the New York Times. And I should tell you that her TED Talk, which is well worth listening to, Nature is Everywhere, has been viewed more than a million times. Joe Roman is a conservation biologist. Uh, he's an author, and he's a fellow at the uh, Gund Institute at uh, Vermont, uh, University of Vermont. And his research interests are really focused on the endangered species policy on marine uh, mammals, whales in particular, invasive species, biodiversity, human health. Uh, he was an environmental policy fellow with the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's been a Fulbright scholar in Brazil, a McCurdy scholar at Duke University, and a uh, Hurdy uh, visiting fellow at Harvard University. Now, for our purposes, Joe is uh, also the author of Listed, uh, Dispatches from America's Endangered Species Act, which was published by the Harvard University Press in 2011. Uh, it won the Rachel Carson Environmental Book Award. Uh, he also wrote a book called Whale, um, which is a cultural history of whaling and uh, those uh, uh, iconic marine mammals. And in particular, um, I should point out that, that Joe is editor and chef <laughs> of a very interesting uh, website called Eat the Invaders, which proposes um, if I may put it this way, that we may well be able to eat our way out of the invasive species problem. So I want to start by uh, asking you, Emma, um, if we may uh, spin off the title of your book, The Rambunctious Garden. What do you mean by The Rambunctious Garden? So the idea of the title is to kind of recognize the position that we're in in regards to non-human nature in the 21st century. Um, to acknowledge the vast human impact over uh, the planet and over the species here, and to suggest that instead of uh, kind of mindlessly and destructively influencing the non-human world, that we take more of a, a, a kind of intentional approach to our relationship to the non-human world. So this is often referred to as stewardship, but I never liked that metaphor that much, um, but I'm a gardener, and so I thought gardening was that kind of a metaphor we could use for a, a kind of a collaborative, happy, positive relationship with non-human nature. Um, but I didn't want it to evoke a super formal, top-down, kind of command and control relationship with every scrap of nature, like a, a knot garden or something like that. I wanted it to leave room for nature doing unexpected things and for surprises and for wildness. It says post-wild in the, so that's the rambunctious part. Mm -hmm. But so, when you talk about nature, when you use the word nature, I don't think you mean nature in this sort of traditional conservationist sense. Well, I've thought about giving up using the word nature altogether. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult to do that in practice, but I think I, we might all be better off if we uh, at least defined our terms uh, more carefully. I think I grew up with a very purist sense of what counted as nature, and I tended to only define find things as nature, things that looked like it did when, at the time of European settlement, or things that were unmanaged and sort of very wild. And um, These days, I tend to think that practically anything that isn't pavement counts as nature, including, you know, highway medians, gardens, sort of spare edges and, and scruffy looking empty lots. Um, I think uh, a larger definition gives us more options for conservation action. Joe, do you agree with that definition? For of nature? Oh, yeah. absolutely. I mean, so it encompasses, and I don't have a, I'm, I'm comfortable with nature and we use it, um, or, or ecology, uh, but it, it encompasses everything from, and I'm still comfortable with wilderness too, from wilderness wild areas to a scrap of, you know, some little area right there, or even something, uh, a small area of a parking lot. Um, I think it can encompass everything uh, including us, you know, we're part of it as well. Uh, so a lot of research that we do are about coupled um, natural and human systems, because it is now. We acknowledge that we're part of nature, an integral part of it at this point. We can have a, a negative effect, of course, or an effect that, that could impact, affect other species, but we can also have a strong positive effect as well if we make, our, make up our minds to do mm. so. I think that, that uh, 
a lot of us in uh, the journalism world um, mm -hmm. who occasionally or as a full-time matter um, cover conservation biology or whatever, sort of actually tend to think of nature or have been taught to think of nature in quite different way than the way that you two were talking mm -hmm. about. I mean, that nature is, nature is that place uh, out there usually um, uh, that's completely untouched, that's pristine, that sort of forms the baseline for the biodiversity of the planet and that if the degree to which humans are involved in it at all is as spoilers. Uh, and, you know, to be clear, I dedicate my life to saving those areas. I work in marine areas. I work also, I do some work in forested areas. And I think those wilderness areas, those, those areas that are not directly affected by humans are essential to protect. And we need to protect more of it and do a better job of protecting it. Yeah, Emma, can we say that there are any areas left that are untouched was your word? I'm just wanna, I don't wanna. I don't, no, I don't think you can. No, mm -hmm. no, because of climate change, obviously. I mean, right. climate change affects every centimeter of the earth. Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna be very strict about untouched, then I think we, we have to agree that nothing is untouched. What interests me is that, um, you know, places that look to, look to my sort of untrained eye as a young person, the most untouched, like something like Yellowstone or Yosemite, are often really mm -hmm. intensively managed to look that mm -hmm. way. Uh, whereas things that look really scruffy and kind of like a weed patch are actually less managed. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the central paradox, uh, I think, of conservation in the 21st century is you sort of have to choose between uh, a, a historical composition and a lack of management. If you don't manage it, it's going to change. And I guess if I use the word untouched, I didn't mean to. I meant more that we're not extracting <laughs> or directly changing that. I completely agree that, of course, we have the impacts beyond just the city or in, in many different ways, whether it's climate change or uh, species restricting species migrations and lots of other ways. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting that, that you all are, are kind of talking about it that mm -hmm. way because as a matter of sort of the science journalism that gets marshaled or rallied to these causes, um, it's, it's often uh, couched in the terms of the uh, you know, defend this last mm -hmm, pure mm -hmm. sacred place. Um, when in fact, say, to use your um, example of the, of the national parks, perhaps, um, which are managed to a ecological baseline, you know, um, they're almost zoos. Or uh, gardens. Well. Um, um, and I think that, you know, just because they are heavily managed, I don't, I don't think that we shouldn't do that there. Uh, I think that, we need to do different things in different places, which is maybe not very surprising. So I think that in places like Yellowstone and Yosemite, it is appropriate to manage heavily. And part of the reason is that because uh, those places are not just for biodiversity, they're also very culturally important to our sort of story as a, as a people. And so I think that, and people want them to look like that. They want Yosemite to look like John Muir's Yosemite. Um, so I'm all for that. It, it's gonna get more and more expensive as the climate changes. and eventually it may not be completely possible to have it exactly the way that it looked in 1850. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of cultural value and in some cases a lot of conservation value in doing that in some places. But then in other places I think we should be more experimental and then in some other places I think we should do nothing at all. So Joe, um, when you hear something like that, I mean I mm -hmm. know when we spoke uh, earlier, uh, you told me like your goal is there should be no um, extinction. Yes. Just as there should be no slavery. I mm -hmm. mean, that's a very powerful mm -hmm. statement. And that's a protectionist statement. Yes. That's a shield over the, the defenseless mm -hmm. statement. That's a nothing can change mm -hmm. statement. It's mm -hmm. certainly not nothing can change. I mean, so extinctions happen. We're, we're just accelerating at about a thousand times higher than it would be in the background rate. So we're. The, when we say zero, I mean zero anthropogenic caused extinctions, which is Although a goal. How you would is a goal. identify a non-anthropogenic extinction would be kind of complicated. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. I mean, so, but there are, we can, you can identify lots that are, sure. that are human mediated. And so really, if we're talking about reducing it by a thousand fold, we're, we're talking about bringing it to zero. Right. Essentially, right. You know, that is achievable. We're, even though, uh, you know, we're not going to get to zero. We can bring that rate way down if we decide to. I've been around long enough to see changes. Let's look at marine mammals. I mean, 
if you were around in the 1970s, great whales were on the brink of extinction. They really were, it could, they could absolutely have gone extinct, and many species, many other marine mammals. We put through the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and then there were some international treaties, and now there are humpbacks in, in New York Harbor. Uh, and there are whales re, you know, bouncing back throughout the world. Not all of them aren't safe. We still have problems with the North Atlantic right whale, for example, which we lost 18 individuals out of 450 this year, and they didn't have any calves, so that clearly they're not all out of danger. But I think we can turn that around. If we don't try, we won't. They will go, they will disappear if we, if we don't try to fight that and bring that down. And one thing that I would add to that is, is I think that moving away from a more pure stance can actually mm -hmm. help with getting to, to near zero extinctions. Mm -hmm. And I think the peregrine falcon is a good mm -hmm. example of that. Would you explain that to us? So when peregrine falcon was in very bad situation as far as its numbers, and there was a concerted and fairly heroic effort to bring it back. But in order to do that, what they did is they wanted to maximize the genetic diversity of the recovered population. So they got as many falcons as they could from all over the place, a bunch of different populations and maybe even subspecies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. some of which, if I around recall correctly, are even from Europe. Yes, around the Arctic. Around, around. And they threw them all into a big peregrine falcon blender, and they got, <laughs> and, and we got. Mm -hmm. I, that's a very scary image, I have to say. <laughs> the genetics. I'm just the seeing genetics, feathers. The genetics. You know? I'm seeing lots of feathers. Um, <laughs> the genetics. And then we got this bird out of it that had a lot of genetic mm -hmm. uh, variability, and that is the peregrine falcon that we mm -hmm. see today, that wonderful recovery story. And so by, by allowing ourselves to be slightly less purist about what's native and what's not native, we were able to have that success. Uh, I think we would do it a little bit differently now, but yeah, they were extinct here. You know, so the eastern, and it's gone, that, that eastern subspecies of peregrine is gone, and now we have this new blend, but it is here and it's fulfilling that ecological role that it would have had 50 years ago. And I think most conservationists have gone beyond trying to hold on to dear life those last vestiges, because it's not really? practical. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so think about Florida panthers. There was a big argument in the 1990s about Florida panthers, it's, on, it's right there, it's looking at me, whether they would bring in new lineages from Texas. There were only about 30 left. They were showing signs of inbreeding. Would you bring in some females from Texas and allow them to increase that genetic diversity? And Fish and Wildlife said, well, we're not really sure because now it's a hybrid but the geneticists convinced them that there used to be gene flow. We're basically reestablishing re movement of panthers again, brought them in, and now populations are well over 100. They're still, uh -huh. they're not a large number, but the signs of inbreeding disappeared. It's not the pure Florida panther anymore, yeah. but the Florida panther was really a relic of being isolated in a small right. place anyway. It didn't want to, you know, it was really what was the last lap. Well, you know, I it's... I'm sorry, yeah, please finish, no, please. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I believe that there's lots of examples of that for conservation. We'll see more, they call it genetic rescues. Yeah. It's interesting, because we have in this conversation sort of raced to a moment mm -hmm. that I thought we might reach mm -hmm. like some uh, minutes from now. Um, when, uh, I have to sort of, you know, you'll forgive me, but, but just let um, our listeners know that your book really pissed a lot of people off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, if I may, um, you know, quote liberally from just one I picked at random, uh, uh, by moving the goalposts to, this is the wildlife news uh, speaking here, by moving the, George? Yeah, uh, by <laughs> moving the goalposts to vacant city lots as an acceptable desired future condition of the landscape, she, our, our esteemed guest, implicitly, if not explicitly, uh, provides cover for all manner of environmental degradation. Um, the point, I guess, being that uh, by acknowledging that human influence is just like part of the landscape, um, and as uh, Joe is, is joining in, that you can meddle for good, you can meddle for good, um, that uh, we're opening the way, this, this dangerous, uh, slippery slope in which uh, all manner of people who um, are not friends of uh, the planet can uh, find justification to continue to pollute or continue to uh, destroy habitats or whatever because, well, after all, it's all sullied anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just changing the kind of wild. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so a couple points on that. The first is, is that if he would prefer that I keep the goalpost to some sort of level of advanced purity and historical mm -hmm. fidelity, then that actually means that we can never make 
return nature, you know, we can never make more nature. We can only protect the nature that we have now, mm -hmm. which means that we're topped out at what we have 13.5% protected mm -hmm. areas. That would, in, that would suggest that 13.5% would be the best we could ever get uh, because mm -hmm. we could never take something that had been sullied and move it back to a nature condition. In a way, he's rejecting that you could even restore. Um, second of all, if your choices are the empty wild lot or pave it over, I prefer the empty wild lot. And I don't think that it's mutually exclusive to want to protect sort of large, contiguous, diverse ha natural habitats and also want to protect a little bit of nature in the city. And finally, I would say that for the forces of development have not needed my argument in the past <laughs> to, to, to have their sway. And I don't think that they need it now. I think that it's always been the case that stopping unnecessary or, or kind of sloppy and ugly development uh, requires that we stand up and say, this is not what we want. This is not what we prefer. We, we, we don't want this to happen. And these are values that come into play. Not Science can't tell you that you shouldn't cut down a tree and put in a parking lot. That you have to have societal values here. And by expanding our definition, I actually think that I'm creating a contingency for more kinds of nature to have people to stand up and say, I would prefer not to pave this over. So that would be my basic response to uh, that. Joe, what do you think? Um, I think since you brought up that time, I think the concern for some conservationists, and maybe that one there in particular, is uh, that uh, maybe we weren't focused on restoration enough. And I think you've defended that restoration, but the idea of novel ecosystems, I think, is what got people. The, the uh, idea of novel ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So this idea that we're going to accept the, that ecosystems are changing, and now there'll be a new, uh, new ecosystems are forming. And that, if you correct me if I'm wrong, and that, that, we, we, that accepting that and maybe protecting those and living with those um, is, is a new way of approaching conservation, whereas historically, and I think a lot of people still feel, you know, that we can restore some of these systems, that it is possible, not use it, I don't think most conservationists use the word pristine. Uh, Except in their fundraising materials. Maybe, okay, well, fair I, enough, I, that's right, well said, okay. Uh, maybe not uh, explicitly, <laughs> although I, I'd say it is, uh -huh. yeah, it's very much the, the tune on which the fundraising fiddle is, uh, is played, yeah. So when I thought about that today, I looked in a, my most recent publication, and I used the word pristine twice for a, um, a, for a national yeah. park in Cuba. Well, there you I'm are, like, oh, I guess charged. I did do Guilty it. Guilty as charged, so I, I, I thought, I've never used that. I'm like, minute, oh, but, uh, oh, I did uh, use that one. Yeah. So, um, but, but, I, so think I think a lot of this criticism comes mm. down to, to people n sort of not being flexible in the sense that we can have multi different strategies in different places. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to novel ecosystems, you know, let's say you've got some sort of jungle that's, that's gone its own way, it's filled with non-native species and they're all in there in an interesting way. We don't have to have one approach to managing that entire landscape. We could try to restore some of it back to a native condition. We could let some of it go and learn a ton about mm -hmm. how those species are gonna continue to interact and change over time. Or we could do some third thing with it, something innovative where we keep some of the old ones and some of the, you know, we don't have to be locked into one strategy mm -hmm. for every place. But I do think it would be incredibly foolish for us to, to restore, even if we could get the resources for this, which would be highly unlikely, to restore every single novel ecosystem back to mm -hmm. some sort of native condition. Because what is a novel ecosystem? It is a bunch of species that are figuring out a way to flourish mm -hmm. in a changed condition. They're, they're right there teaching us how to be a resilient ecosystem in the 21st century in a warmer world. And if we rip them all out mm -hmm. and force them to go back to an ecosystem of 100 years ago, we're throwing away all of that knowledge, all of that adaptation, mm -hmm. and we'd be fools to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm bringing this up uh, in part um, because this affects how, how we write about these things, mm -hmm. how we cover these things, mm -hmm. um, because it's sort of the underlying um, agreement um, by which we approach the regulation and mm -hmm. restoration and alteration of uh, what we culturally hold as these precious spaces. I mean, I was very intrigued that you brought up the example of the panther, mm -hmm. Florida panther, where in fact, we think it's okay now to sort of, if I can use the word artificial in a mm -hmm. kind of looser sense, we've actually created a new panther, mm -hmm, yeah. which we've put in the place and we've said like, well, this is okay. And we are at a moment where technologically, we can actually do this with a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. And as journalists, it's very attractive, mm -hmm. very exciting mm -hmm. to sort of write about these things. 
behooves us to kind of figure out what the framework for it is. I mean, I, you um, uh, did a very interesting piece uh, uh, not so long ago about uh, the uh, effort in uh, uh, Crater Lake to uh, uh, save the, uh, uh, the trees there. The, the white bark the pine. White, the white bark pine is an amazing um, uh, species. And it's, I'd like you to kind of bring us into that a little bit. They're saving this by basically genetically altering Right. The tree. Uh, now, they're using conventional breeding, so don't get too worried uh, <laughs> yet. Uh, but uh, well, the white bark pine is a tricky one because it's, uh, it's, it's susceptible to two different pathogens. Uh, it's a bark beetle and mm -hmm. a blister rust. Uh, bark beetle's native, but sort of enabled by climate change. Mm -hmm. And the blister rust is, is, is introduced. So it's clear that humans are responsible for this tree decline. Um, so a lot of people feel very strongly a moral obligation to, mm -hmm. to save this tree. I feel very strongly a moral obligation to save this tree. Um, but half of the current range and 80% of the future range of this tree is in designated wilderness. Mm -hmm. And by the rules of designated wilderness, you're not supposed to go around fiddling with it. You're not supposed to mm -hmm. do what they want to do, which is raise a bunch of rust resistant seedlings in a greenhouse and then go out and plant them because that would be gardening, wouldn't it? Um, so there's actually been lawsuits where groups who want to plant the rust resistant seedlings are being sued by groups who want to preserve the wildness of those places. So it really pits two different mm -hmm. sacred values of conservation against mm -hmm. one another. Um, and my sense is that ultimately saving the tree is more important than this abstract concept of wildness. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why I think that is because, you know, we like to think that wildness is about other species and being humble, but the whole definition of wildness is centered on humans and whether or not humans are part of the system. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, it's all kind of about us. Mm -hmm. I would hate to see us see species go extinct because we care more about this abstract good than we do about them. Because the tree doesn't know if it's in mm -hmm. a wildness, a wilderness, or if it's in an arboretum. Right. Maybe not. <laughs> But Joe, you have a slightly different approach to mm -hmm. this, um, and a very creative one, if I may mm -hmm. say. I wonder if we could digress for a minute. And uh, with the onset, when I said that, that Joe believes that we may be able to sort of uh, eat our way out of some of our problems here, the invasive species, where you're arguing about what, what has a right to exist here versus mm -hmm. what hasn't a right to exist there, and as a member of a very successful and invasive species, um, <laughs> I take a particular interest <laughs> in this. Um, would you tell us a little bit about um, the website, mm -hmm. um, how it came to be? You were watching a guy harvest yeah. periwinkles, right? Yeah, so I did my PhD on, on an invasive species, on the European green crab, and it was a pretty good gig. I was looking at the genetics, actually, of this invasive species, and in order to figure out how it got here, it, it arrived in 1812 around New York and southern Massachusetts. It's now the most common crab in the rocky intertidal area. You've probably all seen it if you live here and you've been to the beach where there are rocks around. Um, but about the 1990s, it, populations took off throughout Canada and people thought maybe it's climate change mm -hmm. or what's going on? Why is the southern, the species that came over from Europe has mostly been in the Gulf of Mexico all of a sudden exploded. So I went every 50 kilometers from Provincetown, Massachusetts, all the way around Cape Breton um, con collecting them in the intertidal there and uh, to, to examine this. And just to get to that point, found that there's lots of genetic diversity in the north, probably because of ballast water. So there, we're moving, not only are we moving new species around all the time, we're also moving new individuals and new genetic lineages. And that's probably one, another reason why they're so successful. Mm. So they don't really go through a population bottleneck. They come here in the thousands and boom mm -hmm. out. Um, but while I was collecting, I saw this guy who was also flipping rocks and looking in the rock weed. And I was like, huh, I doubt it. Like another biologist here looking for green crabs now. And I went over and he was collecting periwinkles, which is a snail, another invasive species. And, um, and he was selling them to markets in Boston and New York. I don't think he was thinking about, I'm sure, I doubt he was thinking about where they came from. In fact, it's still, it was in the, at that point, it was still contested a bit, though. Um, so it gave me that idea. I've spent a lot of my career trying to reduce our impacts on, in, on endangered species, uh, in particular looking at whale hunting in Japan and the turtle market in Louisiana, doing genetic analyses to see what species there. 
And I thought, wow, here's a chance actually where we want to encourage people to collect them. It'd be great if he took out some more periwinkles because they're there in the millions. Huh. Um, so that day, I, I, or like in the next couple of days, I went and I prepared some green crabs, which are delicious soft shell, and some periwinkles, and, um, and then pitched it to Audubon Magazine. Um, to Audubon. To, to Audubon Magazine. Mm -hmm. And they were interested, and it got published, and... Wait, wait, so, so you pitched what? I a, pitched a, cook, a, a, a short, well, not a uh, like a feature article that uh -huh. that uh -huh. was about invasives, but yeah. about and I'm a biologist, not a chef. So I got Alice Waters, I call, and Jacques Papin, and a couple of other celebrity chefs to sort of give it. Um, and the response was crickets. Like they really, some people laughed, some people hate, some invasive biologists hated the idea. Why? Um, I, you know, at that time, there wasn't a locavore movement. The word hadn't even existed. It was mm -hmm. 2000, or as far as I know it, it wasn't around. And foraging really wasn't big at that point. Um, and I think at, it was in the next couple of years, all of a sudden, people started getting interested in it. And chefs started taking it on. I'm not mm -hmm. a chef, and I, that's, it took me a while to realize that's the way to get the word out. Get, because if, you, if a chef serves you something delicious, you're like, oh, that's pretty good. If I tell you, eat periwinkles, you're like, whatever, I'm not going to go out and try these things that, you know, you tell me are going to be tasty. Um, uh, I, sir, your question, yeah. please. Yeah, when, uh, is now, this you on? promised not to look at them. Oh, oh right. We did. <laughs> <laughs> and we did it. Oh, can we at least look at them while they're asking Yeah, the I question? think that's fair. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> the first thing I thought of when I heard Eat the Invaders was mm -hmm. uh, scorpion fish. And I don't know if you've seen that mm -hmm. all the recipes they're preparing because there's so many of them in the Caribbean and Florida these days. Lionfish. Lionfish, yeah. oh, sorry, yes, okay. Yes, yes. Scorpions, lions, okay. Yeah. Doesn't mean. Yeah. okay, lionfish. And uh, so I was just wondering if uh, there has been some sort of development where you would have chefs being trained mm -hmm. to do this, if you have uh, restaurateurs who are uh, proposing or getting investors for uh, restaurants focusing on this sort of thing and how they would deal with any kind of stigma. And that's kind of a positive thing. On the negative thing, I'm thinking about a, a few blocks north of here, or maybe essentially a block with the rhinoceros uh, sculpture that's there, and uh, how you feel about dealing with the issues that the pressures upon wildlife, whether it's rhinoceros mm -hmm. horns, elephant tusks, dealing with that I encroachment of I've, human I've got I've got to try to focus that for you, I'll if you don't mind. OK. Because um, your first part was, yeah. I think, quite on point, and it was yeah. a really yeah. good question. So if it's OK. Well, OK. Um, I want to do it. So you've taken this forward, yeah. all right, and you now uh, are uh, whipping up uh, uh, culinary conservation mm -hmm. remedies for lionfish. Mm -hmm. How many um, how many species do you have on your on your menu at the moment? I'd say twenty five, but lionfish uh, are at the top. It's a that mm -hmm. this, that is it's the gateway species. It's a firm white meat, and there's we've we've hunted it out. We've hunted out grouper and snapper, and it's a good replacement. Um, it's on menus throughout uh, uh, in several places around mm -hmm. in Florida and the, the Caribbean. It's a, the, their hunt is encouraged, and the first response, which was legitimate, were people when I posed this idea. Well, is it really going to have an impact, or is it just some people are going to go out and catch a few and? it really isn't gonna make a difference to the ecosystem or not make an ecological difference. Lionfish, we have evidence now that intensive hunting does reduce them. Not that, not that surprising maybe, we've done that with lots of species before it, but that also um, there are more native, species, more native fish species returned to those areas under heavy harvest. Um, now, but I, but I wanna be clear because I'm also an invasive species biologist that's not the answer. This is like a good idea to do because they're already here, but the answer is really to stop bringing in new species. Is my, that's the okay. first thing as a policy we want to do. This is the third line of defense. Okay, maybe. the reason I bring it up, it, I mean, mm -hmm. it's fascinating and mm -hmm. it's very clever. Um, uh, and I like green crab. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the, um, but as a scientist, mm -hmm. I mean, you're supposed to make your impact by writing nice, Mm -hmm. you know, tame research papers mm -hmm. and publish them in peer-reviewed journals where people like Emma and I will then pick <laughs> them up and shout them through um, our microphone, uh, megaphone. Um, so I'm curious why as a scientist, number one, uh, you feel obliged to reach beyond that, and two, why your vehicle of choice is a publicity stunt. Mm. 
So uh, I'm a conservationist first and a biologist second, maybe. I mean, I don't know that mm -hmm. I ever really tear them apart. So I, don't, I, I okay. spend a fair amount of time doing policy. Uh, you know, I wrote that book because I, I was a AAAS fellow, as you'd mentioned, okay. in DC in 2006 when um, the, the Endangered Species Act was under, probably until now, it yeah. was the gravest I had seen it. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought it was important to put a book out about that. Um, so I work both. The, so I work both angles and the eat the invaders because I also do popular writing. Uh, it started as a couple of pieces in mm -hmm. Audubon and then New Scientists and a couple of other places yeah. picked up the idea. So you know, it got play, and then I thought, well, one way to get to keep that going is is there's a website where we could people could okay. access it. Right. And it get you know of of all the things I've done, maybe only whale poop is the only one that's maybe more popular. Like I get calls all the time about eating invaders. You know, right. I mean, people are but, still. But okay, interested. yeah. So you you mm -hmm. and I want to bring you into this in a second. But this is not a one-off for you. So you mm -hmm. have the the clever idea of attracting mm -hmm. attention to the problem of the fish by creating a kind of that's media cool. focus um, on on the eating. Mm -hmm. You can eat well. There are right things to eat and and wrong things to eat, and I suppose if you were eating lionfish in their native habitat, that would be a no-no. Um, but uh, not something that uh, a hungry consumer is going to be mm -hmm. attuned to. But you also um, have, have kind of done other things, turning um, the, uh, the, yeah, your, your idea of turning Guantanamo Bay into a, a peace park and a marine mm -hmm. sanctuary as a way of... Right. Um, that's not a serious proposal, perhaps? Perhaps uh, it is. It's very serious. It's go. just not right now. Not right uh, now. Okay. It, Cubans have a word called luces largas, or your high beams. And that's a high beams goal. Okay. I mean, you know, okay. I, I, well, under Obama, yeah. I really thought, you know, he yeah. wanted to close Guantanamo. That was serious when I proposed it. Now we're going to have to ah, wait okay. a while. But, you know. I'm uh, so. uh, warped by the hindsight of history. Right. Professor Fagan, you have a question? I'm really interested in a, a, a couple of, of things that, that seemed absurd 10 years ago, but are certainly technologically feasible now. And that, that is this idea of, of de-extinction yes. and also deliberate extinction, uh, you know, via gene drive or mm -hmm. some, other, some other means. There's been a lot of talk about mosquitoes, of course, for example. It seems like if you believe, as seems obvious, that humans are the dominant force, if not, the, the, they exercise, the, the, they have more power than, than any other species. Uh, it, they don't necessarily control the planet, but, but they shape the planet more than, more than any other force. That, that if you buy into that, you, you it's a small ethical jump to, to say, well, it's time for us to, to instead of accidentally, but deliberately uh, affect the, uh, the biodiversity around us uh, by all technological means possible. So I guess what I would love to hear you both talk about is the wisdom of this, the ethics and, and ultimately the wisdom of, of either deliberate extinction or reanimation. God, Emma, because we were talking about the, the effort to create a resistant uh, pine, mm -hmm. um, I wonder if, if you'd take a crack at that, because mm -hmm. Dan, in his, uh, in his wisdom and insight, has gone straight to where I was going to take you <laughs> on, um, which is, no, no, it is, okay, so this is great. We're now at a moment where, you know, thanks to CRISPR and a bunch of other things, we can now have reasonable sounding conversations mm -hmm. about de-extinction. Let's fix... Um, all the nasty things we did to the Great Plains by reintroducing, reviving, revivifying, whatever the right word is, the passenger pigeon of all things. Let's bring back the mastodon to let the elephants engineer the landscape to their content. I mean, how do you view this and what do you think of the choices? So I think um, while the mastodon is definitely a sexy topic, I think the, the sort of lower hanging fruit is, um, is more immediately interesting to mm -hmm. me. And the thing I wrote about recently for Wired was about the idea of using CRISPR to deal with non-native rodents on mm -hmm. islands where they cause uh, big problems. So I, I sort of uh, am perhaps the lone defender of non-native species when it comes to plants on continents. I don't, I'm not that worried about them. But when it comes to predators on islands, they can be very destructive and cause a lot of extinctions. And the current way to deal with that is to poison the heck out of them. Mm -hmm. And I 
I think I support that, but it's mm. hard because that's a, uh, the way they die is not particularly um, pleasant, and you know, there's sometimes those that poison can then ripple through the through the food web, and there's a sort of a, an upper limit of an island that you can do that way. Once you get mm -hmm. to islands where people live and where there's farms, you you, can't, you there's not enough poison in the world to make it feasible. So. The piece was about whether or not using CRISPR to, to genetically engineer rodents to carry infertility genes and then to put those rodents on these islands to spread those genes throughout the population uh, until they got to the, the sort of prevalence where they would, their, their, pop, their infertility would kick in with double copies and then the population would crash to zero. And I find that uh, quite tempting as a research avenue because it gets, it addresses your problem of these non-natives in a very humane way. They just don't reproduce. It's, there's no killing. Mm. So I find that mm. you know, something that I think should be looked into. Now, and I personally don't have any particular um, moral uh, opposition to genetic modification per se. I think it's mm -hmm. a tool like any other tool that you need to assess each usage on its own uh, for whether or not it's an ethical route mm. to take. Uh, you know, there are some people who just say no genetic modification is mm -hmm. acceptable, but I see it as very much contiguous with all of the other domestication mm -hmm. and artificial selection our species has done for a long, long time. Um, and I think that then going looking beyond that to some, to, to some of these kind of more razzle dazzle conservation things that we might do down the line, I, I mean, I think there's definitely things to look at. I mean. Look, right, right now there's a lot of cons conservation reliant species that mm -hmm. we do things like vaccinate for illness or mm -hmm. uh, otherwise sort of care for in this way that we have to re-intervene in their lives every generation. Mm -hmm. And some of those issues could potentially be addressed mm -hmm. in a one and done fashion with some kind of genetic modification. If the black-footed ferret could be given a plague resistance gene, we could then walk away from them and stop getting in their business mm -hmm. all the time and they could be more of a wild species. So I think that there's definitely some potential there. I also think the process that uh, uh, the global in society that should go through to make the decisions about whether to ever release any of these organisms should be incredibly broad, incredibly careful. Uh, there should be a deliberative process that everybody's invited to. It shouldn't just be a bunch of experts saying we've decided this is the right thing to do and oops, we, we let them out last week and we didn't even tell you about it. So. That's what I think. I don't know. Don't worry you on the uh, re-engineering yeah. nature. Uh, so if we're talking like the far out, the, the bringing the mammoth back, um, I've heard George Church at Harvard talk about this the, in a lecture, and I was more open-minded before the lecture almost than afterwards. Because, <laughs> um, George can the, have that effect on people. <laughs> because then I saw what, it re, what they were really producing, which was an Asian elephant right. with a certain amount of mammoth genes, mm -hmm. and this Asian, you know, and, and then w elephants are conscious animals, right? So this is a mother that has some sort of feelings for this, this animal, this, this calf that she's gonna produce. That is gonna be a hybrid, and then is gonna be released on the steps. And then he was talking about that it would help combat climate. When they started talking about the services provided, I was like, yeah, you, I think it's going too far. Is there a coolness factor to this? I mean, I would rather do it for an extinct crab or something, but people aren't going to be that excited about it, right? But you know, then you wouldn't have those issues of the having this mother having to give birth to this. Yeah, the social uh, issues so, are a big deal. Uh, yeah, so uh, that one I'm a bit on the fence. Passenger pigeon. Maybe, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's the same issue. One thing to um, think about, too, is the donor base for mm -hmm. these, I think, mm -hmm. is different than the donor. So one criticism has been that it would funnel resources oh, away okay. from traditional conservation. I think a lot of these donors are okay. new to conservation. Mm -hmm. And there's an argument to be made that these kind of projects are, are looping them in in a way that, you know, you hook them with the mammoths, and mm -hmm. before you know it, they're donating for the, fer the black-footed mm -hmm. ferrets mm -hmm. and the passenger. You know, you, you just kind of walk them towards Mm -hmm. uh, being part of the broader conversation. Right. Possible. Yeah. We have a question here. So you're talking about you know high tech solutions and spending a lot of money on bringing back species that have you know already become extinct. A lot of times when you talk about the idea of extinction, people come around to the fact where okay, where if there's only a hundred a hundred individuals left in a species, like is it 
is it responsible, is it viable, is it, you know, is it the best solution for conservationists to spend zillions of dollars trying to preserve these 100 individuals and help that population grow, or should conservation divert those funds and say, you know, let's look at land conservation, let's look at species that we know can actually be saved, that, you know, like, maybe in reality we need to let go of a couple species. I wonder what you have to say about that. Uh, I would be uncomfortable with that, and I, and I also feel like it's not the same money, but, you know, it's not like we take this pot of money and put it to, for example, the vaquita. So here's a cetacean. I think there are 10 left in the world in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and the, the idea was let's do what we did with the ferret and the condor, which was also bitterly argued in the 1990s and mm -hmm. take them all into captivity, except the first female died. Mm -hmm. And then the, the calf showed sign of stress. Now, this is, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about what the, the reality of the situation is, but I still think we need to do that. I, I am still willing to put resources and time to make uh, the best effort we can for that species. And I would probably be willing to do that for as many species as I can. If, you know, if it really was a pot and, and it was okay, you know, DY has got this much, this many millions of Department of the Interior is this many millions of dollars and they're gonna parcel it out. It, the endangered species conservation doesn't work that way and I don't think environmental groups work that way. If it did though, and people do talk about triage, which is I think where you're going, um, then you'd have to make those decisions. At this point, I, I don't know, I haven't seen like a systematic decision where we have to say we're gonna let that go. I don't know how you feel. Yeah, I, I think that's, I mean, I, I don't know if I have an answer for that because mm -hmm. I, I think I'm torn both, both ways with that argument. Mm -hmm. um, it does seem that we have this, this human tendency to not really notice or care until things are really bad mm -hmm. and then we swoop in. And that is frustrating because if we had just gotten our act together a couple of generations before, or 10 years before even sometimes, uh, we, could have, we could have done a lot more good for a lot less money. And so I do think it's good to question and, and be critical about this sort of heroic last minute conservation. And since this is a journalism mm -hmm. context, you know, I do think about those stories of those heroic last minute interventions mm -hmm. are incredibly compelling and arguably mm -hmm. easier to tell and easier mm -hmm. to sell than a story about some land trust that's just doing the sort of day-to-day -day grind of, of acquiring land and stopping it from being developed and doing the kind of far in advance conservation mm -hmm. that I think we should be trying to do. So one thing that I think about as a storyteller is how can I glamorize uh, this less heroic last ditch yeah. stuff. Um, having said that, there are a couple of pieces have come out about the Vaquita that have been super good. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, um, so I don't have an answer for that, but I think it's, some, it's something I think about a lot. Yeah, so as a journalist, though, then how does this affect your approach? Well, I did, I sort of made myself a pledge uh, some years back to, that I would, you know, for every story I write about something that's going terribly wrong, I have to write like five about something <laughs> that has some sort of solutions in it or some sort of hope or some sort of uh, progress. Um, some some good news occasionally. I, I do think that a that a diet of pure pure tragedy mm -hmm. does have the effect of burning people out. Um, not not just the readers, but also me as a journalist and and many of my colleagues in this field. Uh, we do have to tell the stories about things going right. They do in order for us to have some kind of hope and sort of momentum. So that's one thing that I'm pretty um, conscious of. Um, yeah. I mean, you're conscious of this as a matter of avoiding personal burnout as a writer? Yeah, or as burning, a matter out, of burning keeping... out the world, you know, burning out yeah, the readers. Yeah. And also, you know, I, I think um, that sometimes there does tend to be a certain amount of selection bias. It, it, there's a double selection bias. So uh, stories about things going right with the environment sometimes have, I mean, papers about things going right with the environment sometimes have trouble getting mm. published. Mm. Uh, in part because, like, let's say, let's say it's something about climate change and uh, there's some study that suggests that things won't be as dire as uh, for a particular species in a particular time as we thought or or maybe even heaven forbid that they might benefit in some way. Um, it's very difficult to get that published mm -hmm. because journals and peer reviewers will say this will just give ammunition to those crazy people who don't believe in climate change. And then mm -hmm. if it does get published, I have a very difficult time writing about that because for the same reason. My editors don't want to 
tell us stories about mm -hmm. things going well. Mm -hmm. But I think that even though these are the minority of results, I mean, climate change is not going to turn out well for most, for most systems. I do think that these stories are part of the whole overall picture of our changing world. And I think we have a responsibility to tell the whole story. Mm -hmm. I want to ask a question that came up initially. You and I were talking about it the other day, and it was uh, something that came up as an act of criticism. And, and you'll forgive me for using you as a poster child. But it, it's, a, a, I think, a key question for a lot of the uh, beginning journalists in, in, in the room or who might be listening. And, and certainly, a, 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 it's a question that torments me a little bit, which is, you don't have a science background, right? You're not a PhD in conservation biology or molecular or whatever, or, mm. So how do you have standing to be anything except a dutiful stenographer <laughs> of people like Joe? Um, uh, you have, with the rambunctious garden, with your book, I mean, it's a, it's a very strong uh, argument um, to, try and change a conversation. And some of the critique of that work was that you don't have standing to do that. Right. It's, uh, you're, out, you're out of your place. You I, should be, go back to the kitchen with the help. <laughs> yeah. And we'll call you up into the dining room when it's time for a press conference. Well, I think it's fun, funny you use the phrase dutiful stenographer, because I actually was a secretary in the botany department at the University of Washington <laughs> for a while. <laughs> um, and I did some typing of manuscripts. And, uh -huh. uh, but. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have a science degree, but I've been writing about this field since 2004. Um, and I have spent a lot of time going to conferences, reading mm -hmm. papers, talking to these ecologists. And it's my planet too. I get to have an opinion about this stuff. So does everybody else. I get to have an opinion. And I think that my opinion is, argue, you know, I don't think it's any less valuable than somebody who has a degree. I think it has actually a certain separate value because I was not raised in the church of conservation mm -hmm. biology. I wasn't trained with it. So I potentially am able to see some values that are in the field that, that people who have been in the field for years might not notice, some assumptions that mm -hmm. were baked into mm -hmm. some uh, to the field that maybe people started to overlook. I think being an outsider gave me a little bit of a unique perspective that was in fact useful for putting the mm -hmm. book together. Mm -hmm. um, that having said, it doesn't stop people from criticizing me for being a an interloper. No, no doubt. But I'm, I would sort of ask a, a version of the same question of you, Joe. You, um, you know, a, a mild-mannered uh, uh, scientist. Uh, you're <laughs> supposed to stick to your side of the fence, and not always. But in the past, there's a, a penalty for uh, researchers who, <laughs> who transgress by uh, attracting public attention in an unseemly way. Yeah, I think that. Do you, do you that, find that? Um, I think you. there was push you, sir. Yes, I think there is certainly the pushback for the invaders. It is a cheeky idea, you know, so that one mm -hmm. was pushing it and I, I, I expected some pushback. And I've gotten that for a lot of pu scientific publications that I've done as well. I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, as far as the attention from the press, the one thing, I don't, I've never gotten the feeling when a journalist calls up any of my colleagues, they're thrilled because this is work that you've been doing for a couple of years. Most of it goes unnoticed. Right, you know, so if you pick up an, one of my ideas and run with it, that's awesome. And I think that's true for many conservation, many scientists in general. So you know, yeah, but see, that's the dutiful stenographer part. It you is. tell me your great idea, uh -huh. I write it down, and then I parrot it. But right. if you tell me your great idea and then and I write an article about how stupid it is, that's the kind of a, I mean, <laughs> well, an yes, informed critique. That. That's, that's a that's different. True. That's Got a it. different role. Yeah, fair enough. Um, uh, and. Um, in the past, we're not, we, we were trained to not bring our biases to these topics, and I think both of you, I'd be yeah. interested in your thoughts on that. Now our biases are part of our product. Well, well you know? Joe's field yeah. comes with a bias. I mean, conservation it's, biology, it's, right. it's baked in from the beginning. Absolutely. So we're, it's a different scientific field than almost any other scientific field for that reason. Or medicine. I mean, medicine right. has Good a goal. Yeah. yeah, so we, you know, I would talk to my, you were, the, when we were talking earlier about that idea of not telling good stories. I think that has shifted in the past five to 10 years. Mm. Um, that now there are more species are being delisted for mm -hmm. recovery. I think we were all like, oh, let's not do that because it, it causes problems. But now 
the problems of not doing it, I think, outweigh the problems of doing it. As one of my friends called it, you know, none of us like got into this field to write obituaries for nature. Mm -hmm. That is not the goal. Mm -hmm. You know, the, our goal is to actually start to think about solutions. Think about it like doctors. You know, when you go to medical school, you're not thinking that all your patients are gonna die, even though all your patients are gonna die, but how are you gonna make their life better, you know, and, and that's, that's what we're setting out to do as well in, in that way. Um, I think I might have veered off no, the okay. question there. Emma, you write op-eds uh, in addition to sort that's of right. classic um, shoe leather journalism. Do you find your ex ex expressing opinions in public uh, undermines you as a journalist in other endeavors? So I was, I didn't know how this was going to play out. I mean, when I wrote Rambunctious Garden, it was intended to be fairly straight reportage, like this, these are new conversations and things that are happening in conservation, and I will now tell you about them. But I am lousy at keeping my opinions to myself, and so my enthusiasm for these new approaches just was completely evident to anybody who read the book. And so it was, t I mean, it, I remember the first review that described it as a manifesto, and I just about wanted to crawl under my bed <laughs> because journalists are not supposed to publish manifestos. Um, so, but since that, I, I've kind of, you know, just decided to embrace the fact that I have opinions and to be forthright about them and to just lay them all out on the table on the sort of transparency is better than pretending to be an unbiased robot uh, model. And although I wasn't sure how it would go, I don't feel like I've lost any opportunities to write more sort of straight reportage because I have written some things that are opinionated. I think that in some very specific cases it would probably be an issue. So my most recent op-ed in the New York Times uh, opposed, a, this was written in collaboration with Don Gentry, who's the chairman of the Klamath Tribes, which is the uh, tribe where I live. Mm -hmm. uh, we wrote this op-ed, the op-ed was very clear we don't like this pipeline, we don't think it should be built, do not put this pipeline through our, through our community. So I don't think I could write about that pipeline for the New York Times. But I think that a lot of other, I don't think that having an opinion has stopped me from being hired to write about the world. Both of you have written books. I'm sorry, I have a question. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you mentioned the Klamath tribe because my my question was, there, there's been discussion about redefining nature, mm -hmm. but what hasn't really uh, sort of implicit has been that we're pervading all of nature, we're affecting all of nature. And I, I was wondering about the community dimensions of these things, whether it's the people living in and around Yellowstone, the people living in and around Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique, in your your, your research, your writing, um, how, do, how do people determine the way that we approach these problems? Because in the end, if you're gonna have real world conservation efforts, they have to be informed by these various communities and publics. And on the one hand, the world is a smaller place, but there's an awful lot of diversity in the viewpoints mm -hmm. on these things. So that was my yeah, I can take a little bit at that. Yeah. Um, I had a piece maybe last year called Slow Conservation, um, because that's the way you have to build with the com local communities, or that's, if you don't work these um, policies through with stakeholders, it's not gonna, they're, time and time again it fails. So I think that it, it had, does become more community-based, and we're, you know, conservationists aren't typically very good, that's not what we do, I wasn't trained to sort of, you need mediators, you need trained people that will come in and help, and I've seen the difference. When you have a mediator there, we have someone who's paid to facilitate the conversation, it goes great. You know, we're not great. It, they, you know, they, the, they, it goes much better than it goes without it. And thinking about communities and your op-ed, um, I'm on the regional planning body for New England, which is for ocean conservation. And uh, having the tribes there, the members of all the tribes there, made a huge difference in the language and discussion of what we call wildlife, because they use terms like our cousins in the oceans and our brothers and sisters, and, and talk which what, as a conservationist, we really wanna do, but it's hard for me to do it culturally, seven generations. You know, you're answering seven generations down and seven generations of your ancestors. Like, if we did that, we'd be good. Like if we decided that's how we're gonna manage the world and, and, and the planet, it, things would change. Can you write about it that way? 
uh, write about Maybe. the community aspect, or? Mm -hmm. Well, with or the kind, of, I could write it about the, with the, the kind of voice that yeah. you're talking about. It would about. be easier maybe than at a meeting, mm -hmm. if I'm representing mm -hmm. the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always think it's good when conservation biologists own up to their deep emotional connection because mm -hmm. um, you know, you're know you trained to be scientists, and so sometimes uh, this deep love that conservation mm -hmm. biologists feel for nature gets kind of, kind of smushed into their research, mm -hmm. and they try to make it like a part of their science, but they won't admit that there's just a lot of love there. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but but to the broader question of the of people, I, I think it's a great a great question. Thank you, um, and it, and I, it all it the the root of every environmental problem we have. There's one thing that's always a variable, and that's human behavior. Um, so I think dealing with people and talking to people and listening to people and and always studying people as part of the system is incredibly useful. Um, I also think that um, in specific. If specifically talking about indigenous people, I think it's always helpful to, to check ourselves and think very hard before we call anything a wilderness. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because not only is it very unlikely to be true, we also are often, our neighbors are the contemporary indigenous people who are the descendants of those original land managers. So it's kind of insulting and horrible to uh, get to talk too much about pristine wilderness, uh, mm -hmm. to, 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 to claim that these lands are pristine wilderness. Sure, I mean, we're seeing that just in the last couple of years with the sort of changing ideas of the pre-Columbian settlement of the Amazon Basin, which right. is our, you know, classic pristine, biodiverse rainforest that must not be touched. And was, you know, according to sort of the latest LIDAR studies and things, I mean, the site of an urban civilization of just remarkable complexity and density. And what you're looking at is a uh, second growth, highly managed forest. It's not so different than the overgrown colonial farms of New England, which we don't have the same kind of romantic attachment to as, a, as an icon. We have a, a question. Hello. Uh, so I was interested in hearing uh, from both of the speakers about um, their thoughts from a conservation and wildlife management perspective on a species like the rhesus monkey in India, where it's thriving because it is sneaking into marketplaces and mm. taking people's food, stealing their, like, the vegetables and fruits they have on display or salty snacks or mm -hmm. the sodas. The sinanthropes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the question. Yeah, no, that's a good question because no one has any respect or love for species that have successfully adapted mm. to us. You know? Yeah, I think there's a little bit of pop psychology there where we tend to displace uh, our sort of disgust with our own actions onto the species that, that mm -hmm. uh, accompany us on that journey. So uh, we hate the rats, but we're the people who throw the trash on the ground. And likewise, we often vilify non-native species, mm -hmm. but we're the ones who brought them here, created the disturbance in which they thrive, and otherwise manipulated the ecosystem so that they can become dominant. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of a displacement activity that goes on, I think. Well, plus we, we also don't like to, or doesn't occur to us, I suppose, to think of uh, urban mm. areas as just different kinds of nature preserves. Mm. I think that that kind of urban ecology thinking is becoming more common, which is mm. really exciting to me. And I think you see more, you know, and it, part of it is the return of things like yeah. raptors to the city. Um, but you know, obviously, what are the raptors eating? They're eating a lot of rats. Mm -hmm. So if you want to see a lot of hawks and falcons, you, you don't want to necessarily get rid of all the rats, which is kind of an interesting idea. Um, although I think you could probably have a lower density of population if they were just going after, what, squirrels and uh, what else? Do you, do you have a, a thought about that question? Pigeons. About that you question. Know, Mon um, monkeys not, in the yeah. jungle, good. Uh, monkeys right. in the marketplace, bad. <laughs> yeah, not. To, I don't know any much about that specific one, mm -hmm. but the return of urban wildlife, I think, is fabulous. I mean, it causes conflicts, mm -hmm. uh, so it's not everyone embraces it. But having, a, since most of us are urban, mm -hmm. having some interaction with wild, the more interaction we can have with wildlife, I think, the better. And. Uh, if I, I, there may be some, I mean, some people, absolutely, I live in Vermont, are repelled by coyotes and shoot them on sight. But I think probably also some New Yorkers find it pretty cool that coyotes came into New York, right? 
that you know that I don't know what the, I actually you you guys know I'm not I'm not <laughs> sure what the response is to that, but I certainly found it great. Or I was living in Boston and having wild turkeys come back, like see mm-hmm. them right there is mm-hmm. is crazy to me, um, but in a great way. Um, granted, you know there's there is some management. I would hope it's not um, eradication, but you know just making sure that the animal is safe and the people are safe. But. Yeah, it, it's, it speaks to this whole human nature duality. Mm-hmm. You know, so, and sometimes we, we want it, all the nature to be out there and we want none of it in our space. And I think that it's very positive when we can, we can break down that duality and we can A, admit our influence out mm-hmm. there and B, invite more of the nature mm-hmm. into our own lives and kind of blur that together in a, in, in a way that I think feeds our soul a little better. Uh, I'll tell you one a paper that I just read um, about leopards. Um, in India, uh, outside of a city, they are reducing rabies because there are so many, the, the rabies are transmitted through stray dogs. Mm-hmm. And so having leopards on that outside, which many people are like, I don't know if I want leopards out there, but actually can reduce disease burden among people in that, in that city. So, There's a similar uh, paper connections. that was really cool about mountain lions and road deaths. Right, that, that if you have mountain lions, it reduces the number of people mm-hmm. who die by hitting deer mm-hmm. on the road because the, the mountain lions are reducing the number of deer. I think that uh, there's definitely a big chunk of the Northeast that could probably do with a few more cougars. <laughs> we'll take them. I'm ready. So I want to ask you, too, about book writing for a moment, um, each from your own perspective. Um, uh, I'm curious, you know, why why go? Why, why make the jump? Why, why mm-hmm. take on a book? Um, how you went about it, and then uh, what it did for you, Emma. Uh, I got mm-hmm. obsessed with these ideas, and I think that's the when you should really only write a book if you can't stop thinking or talking about your subject. If it sort of consumes you, uh, because writing a book is hard and it doesn't pay very well, and it takes up a lot of time. Mm-hmm. If you're a freelancer like I am, the time that you could be doing, making more money by just writing a lot of shorter pieces. So I do think you have to be really passionate about it. I, I think that, uh, and also you have to live with it after the book comes out. Mm-hmm. I mean, my book came out a long time ago now and I'm, right, I'm sitting here staring at a copy. So <laughs> um, you, you wanna make sure that this is, I mean, it's almost like a mar- marriage. You need to make sure it's the right one before, mm-hmm. you, before you take the plunge. Um, and the year I wrote my book was a tough year. I'm not going to lie. I was broke. It was hard. And um, uh, but I'm really glad I did it. And it did change my career. It opened some doors for me. And it also changed me from being sort of a generic environmental journalist to somebody who has a point of view, uh, somebody who's got her own take on this rather than is just a dutiful stenographer. <laughs> so that's my book story. No scars. No scars. Oh. Um, so my, I've been interested in endangered species conservation since as long as I can remember, since I was like 10. I can remember reading uh, the daily news and seeing conflicts between the dam, the teleco dam and the, um, and the snail darter. And uh, so this is something I've been thinking about for a long time. And then, and I've always celebrated and been happy about the Endangered Species Act. And then came this conflict came this time when I thought, wow, this law could actually be changed. Um, so that's why I threw myself into it, how it came about. I, just by chance, I reviewed a book for Harvard University Press. So I had, did, I had lunch with the editor. The, so that's sort of the technical way that mm-hmm. it came about mm-hmm. is I gave them something kind of for free, not expecting anything back, but mm-hmm. you know, it's like, oh, well, nice review. Do you have any ideas? Um, so then it was that tough time of, you know, a year and two years probably ultimately working on that book that, uh, Were you tenured? I, uh, yeah, no. So that's the hard part. No, I'm sorry. Yes or no. Off. Yes or no. 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 Uh, no. And so, so as throwing an untenured, all those, untenured exactly, professor. Th- I'm throwing a lot of research. That, so the year the book came out is my worst publication record as a scientist. Or the year after. I can't remember what. Mm-hmm. And that matters because it's yeah. a gap. It's like, boop. And yeah. you know, people notice that it's far enough now away that I, I don't worry about it. But when you see that, you're like, oh, you have to, and no one really asks you. They're just looking at your CV. They don't ask, what did you do for that year? And they're not going to necessarily make that connection. And plus, it's a popular book, even though it's for mm-hmm. an academic press. So it doesn't give me that, those creds. Right? Okay, so then why is a uh, scientist? And it may just be that I intuitively understand why right. M might do it, because mm-hmm. that's why I did it. Mm-hmm. Um, but as a scientist, yeah. this, is, this is something that you, take a hit to do, right. I mean a career hit to mm-hmm. do. 
Uh, Why because bother? I can't, because the, these topics matter to me, and, and I'm also as interested in literature as I am in science anyway, just by the way. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm interested in literature, science, art, and I think I went down the science path. What David Foster Wallace said something like, Wallace said something like, you know, give it, you like little pellets, you know, I get little more rewards for science. <laughs> you know, like, mm -hmm. so I, for no reason, but, but basically that was, that was the path. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I wanted to do this, mm -hmm. too. Exactly. You know, I, I really care about writing. And scientific writing can really suck. You know, it's just yes, boring. It's really uh, when I found out when I first scientific paper that I had to tell the whole story in the abstract, I'm like, really? Like, I'm telling, I'm going to give you guys the punchline. Why would you read the? Why would you read a scientific article if you know the whole story? And the truth is, no one reads science. Most people don't read them. They just read the abstract, unless maybe you're writing. You know, you really want to know how the paper works, or you really want to know the methods. Or, so you're this, or you're paid to. Or you're yeah. paid to do it, <laughs> exactly. I think it's, um, we shouldn't sell ourselves short here. I think both of us also felt a sense of mission mm -hmm, about our topics exactly. and wanted to sort of spread the word about these ideas mm -hmm. and get people excited about saving species or expanding the definition of nature, both of which, you know, I think. Absolutely. Uh, so if I had, was just interested in something on a purely academic level, mm -hmm. I don't know if I would have mm -hmm. made it happen, but I thought that I could actually I, it sounds hokey, but I thought I could make the world a better place by, by spreading these ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm asking in part because I think individually, these might be the sorts of projects that all of us might want to consider at some point in our career. But also with this particular moment as we sort of started this evening's conversation, we're at a moment right now where sort of culturally, broadly, politically, science, whatever science mm -hmm. is, um, seems to feel it's not part of the public conversation, uh, does not feel for all the public funding it gets, that it has a seat at the public table, and that this is perhaps in part because they don't talk to anybody very well. I, the scientists. Oddly, though, I think mm -hmm. it's a good time for science nonfiction, book length, mm -hmm. non science nonfiction. I think a lot of really interesting and good titles have come out in the last few years, and so, I don't know, maybe that's a common thing to, to re reorient uh, one's energies towards this kind of alternative means of communicating mm -hmm. if you feel mm -hmm. like you don't have a seat yeah. at the policy table. Hmm? Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Professor Fagan, oh. you have a question there from our... Well, actually, the, there was a, a follow-up on Twitter to something that, uh -huh. that uh, we tweeted about. I think it was Emma who said that conservation, biology, and maybe medicine too, Joe added that, are unlike other scientific fields because they have bias baked in. And one of our Twitter watchers is questioning that and says, are they, this is uh, Lindsay Beierstein, and she says, are they really different from the other applied sciences? Seems like every applied science is biased towards its intended application. Hmm. Engineers want to build things that work. Right. Uh, biologists seek understanding, but they also want to use the tools of biology to do something uh, interesting. Is that really so fundamentally different than the biases, the values that are baked into conservation biology? Probably not. It's normative, so there are, there are goals in conservation biology. Uh, I will say, though, that I have, I have a colleague who's an ecologist and says she's thrilled she's an ecologist because if she was a conservation biologist, she'd be losing sleep and it would be miserable because she <laughs> would be writing those obituaries, right? Oh. Ecologists don't have to have an ah, you're, You can be a pure, there are many people who mm -hmm. study ecology and that means they're not looking at, uh, there may be human interactions, but mm -hmm. they're not, they don't have a goal in mind, like sociologists or economists that are studying, because they're not necessarily trying to mm -hmm. change people's behavior, they're trying to observe people's mm -hmm. behavior. Yeah, um, I think she has a know, point, uh, but I guess, I guess that the reason maybe that, that I didn't think of engineering or other highly applied sciences as being analogous to conservation biology is because a lot of conservation biologists really just write academic academic stuff and publish it in academic journals and then sort of stay in their little academic world and they don't, I mean, there's quite quite a few of them that do do really applied mm -hmm. things and get out there with shovels and change things and move animals around in crates and all the other things that conservationists do, but there's also this very vigorous field of, of purely academic mm -hmm. conservation biologists, which is, I think is a slightly unique thing. So, when you look around, do you see the sort of journalism of conservation biology, the, the journalism of the natural environment? Do you see this as a, as a, as a, as a healthy plant? Do you see that uh, there is a community of writers out there who are 
effectively uh, joining this debate, or is it um, just a few? I'd be curious to how you would yeah. answer that. From my point, I've been very lucky. Yeah, I mean, I can. Con I, if I have a store, I, I'm pretty good at knowing whether this story is going to be of interest to journal. Like, so some pieces I publish and great, and some other science is weird, but others I'm like, I think this has got something. And so through the years, through interview people contacting me, I have. I have a Rolodex, but I just have some people in mind that I'm going to shoot an email like, new story, are you interested? That works. And I think most of my colleagues, too, are, are pretty happy with it. We have a great science communications person who could be, you know, stand a journalist and follow mm -hmm. that path, but he's decided mm -hmm. to work at UVM. That helps a lot, of course. So it means I can contact one or two people that I think would be interested, and then he can contact his folks. So I think the dialogue does work. I don't know if every, but maybe I'm lucky. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's because for me, uh, I, I, know how to, I, I know how to do that. Maybe it helped that I, I've been on the other side a bit. So I, mm -hmm. you know, I, I have a feel for what a good story might be. Emma, how do you feel about it? Um, well, I certainly think that there are a lot of really excellent writers writing about conservation. I think uh, what's interesting is that maybe there's a little bit of parallelism with the conservationists themselves in that, that, that maybe they're more mission driven than mm -hmm. the average science journalist. And some of them are very much uh, in it to try to make change in the world. And I count myself among that group of people who are not just there merely to inform, but to try to influence people's actions in the real world. So. Given that there is a range of opinion on how best to do conservation, there's a sort of a parallel range of opinion on, on, on how, how best to cover it and who to cover and which mm -hmm. stories to champion and mm -hmm. which to not. And, and I think it's good, vigorous debate. Okay. okay. Um, so contrary to appearances, let's pretend for a second that I'm a, a young beginning journalist. I want, to, I want to write somehow about my passion for the environment. Uh, where do you suggest I start? Um, how young are you? Are you like 15? Are you like a... <laughs> <laughs> well, in leap year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, um, no I'm a, I'm a, let's say I'm a graduate student at uh, mm, uh, Health uh, Environmental Science. Well, okay, program. all right, let's say that for the <laughs> You know, for, a, just a for Northeastern for... University okay. of some size in a metropolitan <laughs> area? <laughs> I, I mean, one thing. No, where know, do I begin? Where do I begin? Well, that's. I mean, things have changed a lot since 2003 when I graduated from my program. Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot more staff jobs back then, and I, I went and did the staff job thing for a few years, and then went freelance, and that was a really common path that I think uh, is less available now, just because there's fewer staff jobs, so a lot more people are go jumping straight into freelance. Um, but I think that that's very doable. I think that. Looking for stories that go beyond um, this, this climate change is going to make this horrible thing happen, or this sad little animal that's really furry is about to go extinct. Um, I think that, you know, those are stories that we need to tell, but I think mm -hmm. that especially when you're starting out, it's good to try to think, okay, so what, what else is going on? You know, what are, what, what are the kind of strange um, and hopeful things that are happening at the margins? Um, what are the undertold stories? I certainly wish that there were more conservation stories that were, you know, that the sort of geographical spread was a little more even. Obviously. What do you mean? What do you well, mean? I mean, I'm based in North America. I write a lot of North American stories. There's a lot of North American journalists. We're all writing about like wolf reintroduction mm -hmm. and the couple, you know, there's like a few, it, I, you know, I, ho I wish there was a larger international community and that the publications that our, our magazine stories crossed borders more so that I could easily find and mm -hmm. read more stories about conservation in Asia or Africa or mm -hmm. uh, around the world. So that's, but I mean, that's almost more like a plea for me as a reader. I just want to read <laughs> yeah, those yeah, stories. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this may be just your language barrier, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could be. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I guess that's some advice. Okay. The other yeah. advice, too, is that. Um, Burnout is a real, real factor in this particular field, both on the scientist side and on the journalist mm -hmm. side, because they, there are often stories about things going wrong and things going extinct and things going badly. And so you do have to take care of yourself and you have to monitor yourself mm -hmm. and your mental health and your physical health and, and, and mm -hmm. take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. So let me ask the same question, mm -hmm. but instead of being a youngish uh, graduate mm -hmm. student in a science writing program, uh, you know, I'm halfway through my PhD in a biology program, but I want to start uh, cultivating my ability 
to talk directly to the public about mm -hmm. these issues? Where do I where do I start, Joe? There How do are, I do that? Yeah, and so there are some programs that are. I think many scientists recognize that limitation. Though I have to say, many of the scientists that I know are also very good public speakers. It's that those are not mutually exclusive or good communicators. Mm -hmm. I do, th it's very limited for people that either set the time or know how to write well. But that's true probably in general, you know, across the world uh, uh, for, for in, in any field. Um, so if, the, if, the, if a young journalist, so, and students actually ask, this, ask me this all the time. Yeah, can so I do we this were, without yeah, jeopardizing exactly, my right, research, yeah. without um, irritating and, my thesis advisor? Right, uh, yes, and that's, that's an, if the thesis advisor definitely could be a concern. So that, uh, because I was freelance writing and I was doing my PhD and that was, there was some tension there. Um, uh, so we, I, I encourage them to, because I'm not encouraging them to go to, to journalists school necessarily, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but to work on individu individual pieces, whether they're op-ed or some other small pieces as a starting point to get a feel for it, right? Not to start mm -hmm. large and to see if they can land. And then, uh, so I don't know if I have a, a good answer, you know, a, a solid answer um, for that, except um, start small, reach out and, you know, build from there. So I want to follow up on something you just said a minute mm -hmm. ago, Emma. We look at these things with the blinders of privileged North Americans. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is it the two of you? Do you, in your experience, find that say Europeans think about these conversations, these conversations about conservation, uh, differently? Yeah, very much so. I mean, I think it's really interesting that that uh, you know this kind of emotional connection to a, this sort of "Quote unquote unspoiled landscape or this wilderness that, and wilderness being so central to the conservation culture, it's very North American. You see it also in Australia. You can see it also in uh, New Zealand. Uh, you'd see it in places with the same colonial history, mm -hmm. um, because they all have the same experience of some white guy stepping off a boat and going, ah, oh, virgin wilderness, and then, <laughs> and then everybody writing down, okay, this is what this place is supposed to look like forever and ever. But in Europe." Uh, the, the history of human interaction with the land goes very far back and there's no, there's, the white guys were already there, they didn't step off the boat. And so they don't have that, that kind of wilderness baseline. And in fact, I mean, the, the, there's a, quite a bit of ongoing dispute about what big chunks of Europe even looked like, you know, 20,000 years mm. ago, whether mm. they were forests or whether they were mm. open, semi-open habitats. And um, so there, they're, you know, they just, they just have a different narrative and a lot of it is more pastoral. They, they want to go back to a, a, a different kind of agriculture. They want to protect the countryside. They have these mental categories like farmland birds. And, hmm. and so uh, they have completely different conversations about conservation than, hmm. than we do here in North America. And it's interesting. And when I go over there and give talks, often the, the questions are much more about trying to figure out like what our deal is mm -hmm. rather than trying to, trying to uh, you know, critically examine their own relationship with, with nature. Yeah. Although yeah. oddly enough, you know, now rewilding has become a really kind of, pa uh, a, kind of a, a burgeoning thing in, in Europe and wolves are moving into sort of uh, populated parts of Northern Europe and more land has been set aside. They're trying to bring the beaver back and so on. And so they're kind of in a, Bit much more recently getting interested in this sort of w untamed wildness mm -hmm. that has obsessed North American conservationists for hmm. 200 years. Um, so I've been working in Cuba for the past few years. Yeah, exactly. and, um, and so what's amazing to me is, you had mentioned this earlier, uh, this disconnect between sci and science and the government in the United States. And I think that's true. I think there are many of Many scientists feel disconnected um, from policymakers, but in Cuba, it's very direct. That though not everyone's happy with the government, um, what they do have is ac science is plays an important role, and they have hmm. direct access to, or at least the scientists I know, to the policymakers. And I've seen things change just in the like they would complain about it one year, and now about parrotfish being caught too heavily, and now parrotfish are going to be protected by the end of the year. And so anyway, that's one cultural difference that I could see. Um, that I wish we had, that, um, that American scientists had, had felt that way. And, you know, and to what do you there. attribute that? Uh, yeah, I, I probably, 
Um, Strong top-down government? Well, that's certainly part of it, yes. That, that, would, that would certainly be, and probably networks of people that are working together, um, both in the government and, and, in, um, and in academics. So I want to kind of just ask a, a, a slightly crack-related question. You know, we're always told to stay as, as writers, as journalists, whatever, to oh, you know, stay away from the jargon. Don't, mm. don't uh, weigh yourself down with these you know, terribly uh, leaden scientific terms. But I have seen you write about the pleasure of what you called heady argot, <laughs> which I thought was itself a wonderful piece of jargon. Um, <laughs> and I wonder uh, if you can help us sort of get a sense of how in the right moments sort of the jargon can help us take flight uh yeah i mean there's certain little pieces the thing about jargon is that you you learn them as an adult and so one thing that's that's neat about them is you really see them as these words rather than the kind of simple words that we learn as children are, have more transparency whereas i think of jargon as more artifactual words mm -hmm. that we can enjoy almost as little art objects and I certainly have my own uh, little collection of ecology and conservation terms that I really enjoy or that I think I have a lot of metaphorical possibilities. Um, so in the, to give an example of the former, like the word subnivian, which just describes the piece of space underneath the snow. So there's lots of little mammals that run around underneath the snow in the subnivian space. Mm -hmm. And I just love that word. I just think it's beautiful and just cool that there is a word for that. Um, but then uh, look at things, uh, invasion biology that, mm -hmm. that uh, we've been talking about here. A lot of the rhetoric around that, a lot of the jargon from that field taught, is very much tied in with the value-laden mm -hmm. concepts. And so like, uh, even just in ecology more broadly, there's a, a, a phrase called the natural enemy. Um, so a natural enemy mm -hmm. is, is it's sort of in the food web what is going to come eat you, um, either as a predator or even as a parasite or some mm -hmm. other. And the idea that the world is filled with these kind of built-in antagonisms that every species has a natural mm -hmm. enemy is almost like a Shakespearean to me. So mm -hmm. I think that pulling out a couple of these terms and explaining them to the reader and then kind of using them in a metaphorical or a fun way can, can yield dividends. I don't have like a special term at my command to describe just how spectacular this conversation has been <laughs> and all of the places that you have taken us. Um, so if I can conclude this way, if I could save one place as a, as a conservation journalist, it would, it would be this, this psychic space the <laughs> two of you have created where you have shared um, your insights about the world that we inhabit and that we are creating moment by moment. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys.